A year ago I made a video about CED, RCA's Capacitance Electronic Disc, a video delivery system that held video on a vinyl disc which was read by a stylus. It was such a monumental flop it brought down the RCA Corporation with it. With the benefit of hindsight of course, the idea of reading video off a vinyl disc with a stylus seems archaic when Laserdisc had been out for a couple of years prior to its arrival, which was reading of course video off an optical disc with a laser. So clearly Capacitance Electronic Disc was never going to be a success, was it? Well, hold on a minute. Imagine an alternate reality where CED had existed alongside Laserdisc up to the 1990s and had actually been moderately successful. Now, I'm not making this up. This actually happened in Japan with the VHD system. Let's have a look at it. It's largely forgotten nowadays, but in the late 1970s there was a three-way race to be the company to sell the public pre-recorded video on a disc. Philips had their laser vision system, also known as Disco Vision, and then latter to be known as Laser Disc. RCA had the Capacitance Electronic Disc, and the Victor Company of Japan had VHD, which stood for Video High Density. Now, as well as the companies behind the development of each of these technologies, there were additional companies who were brought on board who backed each respective system. For example, Philips had Pioneer, JVC had Matsushita, who brought along their Panasonic and National brands. It was a proper three-horse race. Nobody knew which of these technologies was going to be the one that won out. RCA's CED and JVC's VHD use very similar technologies, albeit the CED has a larger disc inside the caddy at 30cm across. The VHD used a 26cm disc, and it doesn't sound like an awful lot of difference, but in reality it does make it quite a bit of a neater system. The caddy for it feels more like you're holding a magazine rather than a vinyl record. Each disc can hold up to 60 minutes of video per side, which is the same as RCA's larger disc system. So I suppose that's why they called this one Video High Density. We've got the same amount of video, but on a smaller size disc. Those discs are carbon impregnated vinyl, which makes them conductive. But unlike RCA's system, they don't have a groove on them running from the outside to the inside for a stylus to follow. This one uses concentric rings and the stylus measures the capacitance by by skirting across the top of those rings from the outside to the inside of the disc. Just like on a compact disc, the data is stored as a series of pits of varying lengths, but unlike a CD where that data is read with a laser, on a VHD it's read by the difference in capacitance that's experienced by the stylus as it sweeps over the top of them. Each rotation of the disc stores two frames of video, and of course 30 frames make up one second. You can imagine that these rings in reality are very, very close together. But just to give you an example, it would read frame one, and then go to frame two, and then it jumps into the next ring along to read frame three, and so on. Now, of course, this is fine, except when you come to try and do a still frame, because a still frame is done by holding the stylus over a particular part of the disc and keeping the disc rotating. But as you can imagine, that shows two different frames of video, one after the other, which means that you get a bit of a flicker sometimes. But this was a deliberate compromise because a CAV laser disc can hold one frame per rotation and therefore generate a perfect freeze frame. However, it can only hold 30 minutes of video per side. Most of the laser discs sold though were in the CLV format, which meant they still held 60 minutes of video per side, but at a higher resolution than the VHD system. And in addition, there was no stylus to wear out on laser discs. On a VHD, you'd need to replace the stylus every 5,000 hours of play or so. Nevertheless, the VHD system made its debut at the beginning of the 1980s because it held a couple of aces up its sleeves. The first one being that it was quite a bit cheaper to buy a VHD player than it was a Laserdisc system. And secondly, the VHD discs held much of the interactive capabilities of a 30-minute Laserdisc, however, in a 60-minute format. And it was this that drew the attention of Thorn EMI in the UK, who planned to launch it here and sell it to the public. However, they got cold feet after after seeing how the CED system had uh, not really succeeded in the US and decided to pull away from selling it to the public and just made it as an interactive display system. However, they had invested a significant amount of money into the development of VHD in Japan, so of course the system was ready to go and JVC decided to launch it in Japan. 
up until about 1986, there were still plans to launch the VHD system in the US, but I think they dropped the idea eventually due to public apathy to the Laserdisc and CED formats. However, it did continue apace in Japan, and by the mid-80s, 85, 86, it was probably at peak sales. It was quite a popular system. It came second to Laserdisc, but in price, it definitely came first. There's an article here where you can see that people might choose VHD over Laserdisc because the fact a VHD player could be picked up for the equivalent of 576 US dollars, whereas a Laserdisc player was 929. Popping over to the excellent Laserdisc database, we can see they do have a VHD section on there, and that catalogues the last releases on the format as coming out in October 90, and that'll have been about a year or so after the VHD system will have started to wane, and that'll have happened when Laserdisc player prices became more affordable, making the VHD system seem less attractive. You might also notice on there that there are some 3D titles that came out on the VHD system. This seems to be unique to this particular format of the era, and it's perhaps down to the way the discs were laid out. The 3D discs were played at double speed and alternated the frames between the left and right eyes. And of course, you bought some 3D goggles which had LCD shutters in them, which synchronised with those and gave you a full 3D image. And the VHD system was particularly suited for use in video karaoke machines because you could hold 60 minutes of video on one disc while having them accessible by chapters. So with the VHD system dying in 1990, it never got to experience the collector's market of the 90s that the Laserdisc served so well. That's when Laserdisc got its second wind, offering collector's editions with director's commentaries, widescreen, digital sound. VHD was pretty much stuck back in the 1980s, occupying a middle ground between RCA's basic CED system and the more elaborate but more expensive Laserdisc. Okay, so that's the history side over and done with. Let's try playing a VHD. I imported this old machine from Japan. It was advertised as not functioning, so it didn't cost so much. However, the postage was horrendous. This thing weighs an absolute ton. I also bought a couple of discs to play on it. I thought we might as well get some of those ready. And this is a higher end machine that should be able to play 3D titles as well. So hopefully in time I'll be able to get some of those glasses. Had a look inside to see what was wrong and it doesn't have a stylus in it. Well, obviously that's not going to work with no stylus. After a number of months of searching, I managed to find the stylus for this machine. You can imagine somebody having one of these, the stylus wears out. They think, oh, I can't be bothered getting a new stylus and then just putting it away on a shelf. So I imagine if I put this stylus in here, I'll be off and running. However, these things don't always work out according to plan. Unfortunately, the machine itself just didn't work at all. So I've got a brand new stylus for an old machine that's just non-functioning so okay take two buy a brand new machine okay so when i say brand new i mean new old stock it's been sat in this box since may 1987 so almost 30 years so hopefully this thing still works i don't think they use belts in these so those shouldn't have perished i'm just hoping it's going to operate we've got everything inside the box here all the different instruction leaflets of course all in japanese i've only got the guarantee i can send off there in that little envelope and a list of the titles available on vhd i'd imagine this has been sat in the box so long because this was towards the end of the format's life and they probably had difficulty selling the machines off and someone's probably got a warehouse of these somewhere. So yeah, a bit of a lower end model than the other one. Notice it's got cushioned feet on here, spring-loaded feet. That's because, of course, you don't want it to bang around while it's reading a disc. We've got RF in and out on the back here, which a lot of people would have connected it up with in the 80s. We've got the lead included for that. We don't have a lead for these. These are the composite video outs. That's what I'm going to be using, of course. And on the right here, we've got a power pass-through, which you could connect up to, say, an amplifier if you're using it as a karaoke device, and it runs on 100 volts, so I'll need to use a voltage converter. On the front, we've got the power button on the left here, the long door which you put the discs into or the cartridge into i suppose the caddy infrared remote control receiver volume control on the bottom there together with a headphone socket four buttons along the top and we've got lights underneath those to indicate what's going on quite a simple machine but very neat as well of course, the remote control gives you access to all the features of the player. For example, if you wanted to jump to a chapter, type the number in at the top and then press that green button, it would go to that. At the bottom, we've got transport controls. I wasn't sure what these things were on the left, though. So I've got the Google Translate app out. And as we can see, the top button at the top of the screen there, it says that one is mode. The next one down is volume large dog. Brilliant. Uh, this one is small volume, so volume up and down. 
and then this one is repeat on <laughs> what that one means right the batteries that are included i thought i'd check those out before i got going and yeah completely dead so that could have had me puzzled for a while if i hadn't expected that yeah so i replaced them with some brand new batteries instead all I have to do now, in addition to that, is connect the device up to something. So I'm going to test it out here first of all. I'm going to put my composite leads in to the back. And of course, I'm going to have to power the device from something. So I've got a 100 volt step down transformer here, which has enough wattage to be able to cope with this device. So I plug that in, plug the power into that. And to play back the video, I'm going to use this Sony broadcast monitor that I bought off eBay a while ago for next to nothing. They're very cheap these nowadays. Anyway, opening the door on the front there manually because it wouldn't open automatically for some reason, putting the caddy in there and it grabs it. It clicks on it and will not let it go for love nor money. So something is obviously wrong. And then I thought, hold on, it's got a stylus in here. Those are often locked down for transport. So I had a look at this information on the sticker and sure enough, when you translate that, it turns out into some sort of old pirate treasure map language which says before you leave this machine remove this lid and be inside loosen the red thread for transport until it idles sure enough yeah i have to loosen a screw inside here so let's take this lid off and have a look and there it is there's a red screw so sure enough loosen that it releases the arm which is now free to move and as you can see the arm can move inwards however the damn thing still will not let go of my caddy so i'm gonna to have to take the lid off here and see what's going on inside turns out the caddy's being held back by a couple of plastic teeth so i just eased it off though so i could have a proper look at it twisted this cog around on the left the disc dropped down to where it should do and sure enough the video started to play there's always something incredibly satisfying and slightly magical about getting a device working that's been sat in a box, in this case for close to 30 years, that's never performed the function it was designed for. So finally now we can see it working. However, I'm still having issues with the eject mechanism. The arm's moving back and forward fine, the video's playing fine, the door opens on the front fine. However, when I put the caddy up to that and get the disc to eject into the caddy, it just wants to keep hold of that caddy and not let go. So something's still a little bit wrong with that eject mechanism. Now, I'd anticipated that something like this might happen. So I bought a very cheap VHD of a film I'm not particularly interested in because I thought I might have to sort of pull it out of the machine and manhandle it. And if you do that, of course, you damage the surface of the disc, which would make it unplayable. As it was, I don't need to sacrifice this disc. It's a simple matter of a cog not turning its full rotation. You see this little white cog in the top of the screen here, which looks a lot like like the maze symbol out of Westworld. Well, that's supposed to have grease on it, but of course that's hardened up over time. So this little silver arm, this metal arm that's supposed to travel around the track on there wasn't going the full distance. So it's a simple matter, of course, of just cleaning that up and replacing the grease with some new silicon grease. And sure enough, once that was done, it was functioning perfectly. So here's how you operate it. You press the on button, the door on the front opens up automatically. You put your caddy into the machine, it pulls the disc out of the caddy, it will beep to let you know that you can remove the caddy and then it starts playing the disc automatically. And of course when it comes to ejecting the disc, you just press the eject button, the arm moves back to the beginning, the door opens, you put your caddy in, puts the disc back in the caddy, beeps again, you take the caddy away. Very nice and neat really. As entertaining as it is to watch this mechanism, and I could probably watch this all day long, I can imagine this would have been the Achilles heel of the VHD machines. If anything's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong with this. However, mine is now working fine, so let's get it all back together again and just have a look at some of the discs that I've got to play on this. Now, because this video has taken me about a year to put together, every time I saw a VHD advertised at a reasonable price, I picked it up. And as a result, I've got a nice little collection here of some of the 1980s blockbusters. And those were the things that were primarily sold on this format in the mid 80s. That's when it was at its height. You can see on the back here, we've got some other alternate titles that are available at the time. Notice the price is 7,800 yen for these ones at the bottom. However, Aliens at the top 
is 9,800 yen. That's because that's a two disc title. Now that 7,800 yen price, that is exactly the same as a laser disc cost at the time. So it wasn't any cheaper to buy a VHD than a laser disc. It was just the machines themselves were cheaper. I'd imagine a lot of people just rented these things anyway. Now, Return of the Jedi is the only two-disc title I have. Of course, they have to go to two discs when the film length exceeds two hours, which is the maximum you can fit on both sides of one disc. Notice here on disc two, side one says 35 minutes 44. However, side two's got some text next to it. I was interested in finding out what that actually said. Uh, when I try and translate it again in this app here, it says... From B, no. Okay, I suppose that just means there's nothing on here or something. But did you notice something there? Interesting. There's a bit of text in the middle here. When that came on the translation, it said something unexpected for me here. Revenge of the Jedi it will be, of course. Of course, that's the original title of Return of the Jedi. So presumably in Japan, they knew it as Revenge of the Jedi. Or perhaps I'm just talking nonsense. Getting back to what I do know, inside each of the VHD discs that I've got, you get a leaflet like this. In the case of Return of the Jedi, it details the aliens in the film, gives you some production notes, talks about the people that are in it, as well as the people who made it. I think they should give out things like this with films nowadays. You can see this is one of the earlier discs I've got because looking at the bottom here it's going on about the Temple of Doom will be coming in summer 1984 so presumably the disc came out just before then. I've also got Back to the Future which I have to get on every format just for the sake of it and on the back of here I bet they were glad that this one is just under two hours. You can see it just about fits on one disc. Of course I'd imagine when you go over to two discs they'd sell less because the discs themselves cost more to buy. Notice it says digital there. Nothing digital really going on in the film itself. Of course the soundtrack is Dolby around and it does sound good but it's not Dolby Digital. And rounding up the rest of the titles we've got Saigon which you saw earlier on and I've also got this one which is a bit unusual Starview HCT5808. I thought this was going to be anime with music it doesn't have any dialogue in it turns out it's just a load of still frames with some plinky plonky music not that exciting really but only available on VHD or Laserdisc. And then this is the best one Movies number five this is a VHD magazine effectively what it is is a load of different trailers as well as interviews and things put together in order to try and sell u.s films to japanese audiences this was introduced in 1986 when vhd sales were at their height it continued over nine issues with the last one of those coming out in 1988 Inside volume 5 here from 1987, there's a survey to send off to tell them what films I'm interested in seeing on the VHD format. There's also a form you can use to order posters of some of the titles that are featured in this issue. And inside there, there's more information about some of those films as well. Now, you may have noticed at the beginning, I lifted out that form which listed all the titles that were available on the format at the time my machine was made. And there's quite a lot on there in different genres, as you can see, including three issues of the video magazine I've just shown you, as well as a lot of other titles that, unfortunately, I'm unable to read because I can't read Japanese. However, there are a couple of names you can pick out and you can see the headlines for the karaoke ones. But one thing that you might be particularly interested in is interaction. And this is the thing that VHD is most probably famous for now in the West because if you watch any videos of old obscure games collectors you might have seen a VHD machine connected up to an MSX computer playing back one of these interactive games. To explain how this works I'll use Dragon's Lair as an example although it wasn't out on the VHD format but you should be aware in Dragon's Lair it plays an animation until you have to make a choice. For example if you go left you'll die, if you go right you'll be okay. So if you choose to die then the animation that gets played is off the alternate rings on the disc. VHD has the ability to skip individual rings and play the ones with the death animation on them. However, if you choose to go right and survive, it will play the alternate rings. And that's basically how an interactive disc works. Okay, so enough chit chat about things I don't have. Let's play some of these discs that I do. We've got plenty to be getting on with here. I've attached the machine up to the television in the lounge, the main TV, and I've got to say it doesn't look out of date here at all. And that might say more about the lack of imagination of equipment manufacturers than it does of this thing being particularly timeless, but it certainly doesn't seem to have aged any to say it's getting on for 30 years old now. Anyway, put the disc in the machine and let's have a look at it. Now, depending on the age of these discs, there's two different kinds of intros at the beginning of them. So let me play you the old one first, followed by the new one. You 
son of a bitch. So I'll talk about some of the features of the disc while this is playing. The subtitles you see at the bottom, those are burnt in on the video. Those aren't selectable like on a DVD, just like on a Laserdisc there on the actual video itself. You can jump between chapters. You can see how quickly it can do this. I'll press the chapter up button and go straight to chapter four. You can go to an individual chapter if you type the number in on the remote control. The trick play capability is one of the big selling features of the day. Much is made of this in all the promotional literature of the time. The ability to play things in two times speed as you can see here with the sound still playing or you can play in half speed reverse perfectly smooth with no interference on the picture at all. Something that VHS wasn't capable of doing. And of course, you can fast forward at various speeds. It looks just like fast forwarding a DVD or a Blu-ray nowadays, other than, of course, the picture quality. What's particularly impressive, though, is the half-speed reverse, where you can adjust the video back and forth, and there's just no interference at all. It looks perfect. The pause, that is where there was a bit of an issue. You can see here Indy's having a bit of a jitter issue, and of course that's because there's two frames per rotation. So we're jumping back and forth between two frames. If you find the right part of the video where nothing moves over two frames, you can get a pretty good still with it. But of course this wasn't as good as a CAV laser disc, which could do a perfect freeze frame of any frame of the movie. So back in 1980, when JVC were trying to show off their new VHD technology and make it look as good as Laserdisc, they cheated. They put a digital frame store under the table, which at the time cost £10,000 and enabled the operator to get a perfect freeze frame of any frame out of the disc. It just goes to show you how important at the time these trick play features were. Now, I just want to play you the title sequence out of this movies magazine. Remember, this is from 1987, and I've got to warn you that watching this might give you a 1980s overdose. <laughs> In this issue of Movies, you'll ride high with Matthew Broderick in the new suspense thriller, Project X. We'll go behind the scenes of the explosive action-adventure film, Death Before Dishonor. And visit with Bette Midler and Shelley Long on the set of their smash hit comedy, Outrageous Fortune. Ah, the good old 80s. Anyway, you'll notice on the disc here, we've got a table of contents. So we've got a menu system, which is split over a number of screens, and we can access the individual chapters for the particular part of the disc that we're interested in watching. If you wanted, you could watch it all the way through from the beginning to the end in one go. But I'll take you through to chapter 10 and show you a little bit of the behind the scenes of Robocop. Well, today we're shooting the scene where Murphy gets killed by the gang. First they blow off his hand, and then they blow off his arm, then they blow off his head. Wow, what do you say about that? This guy, he's really pretty intense about the whole thing, but the sound of that hand popping off, we've just got to listen to that once more. Brilliant. But I used to love this stuff in the 80s and into the 90s when they did this behind the scenes thing. It's nice to see some of these actors that are no longer with us or people who are a lot younger than they are now talking about what they want to do with their careers. But anyway, let's go on to Back to the Future now and just have a look at some video scenes out of this to compare the quality between these and Laserdisc. So I've got the VHD here, as you can see on the screen, I've done a nice capture and I happen to have the laser disc of this one because I bought the laser disc just to put on the wall as a frame because I like the art on the sleeve but I do also happen to have the disc still out of it so we could do a nice a b comparison and I'll do a freeze frame out of the VHD and I'll do a freeze frame out of the laser disc and we'll see how much difference there really was in quality between the two formats so first off starting with the VHD you can see it's pretty washed out isn't it I mean it's not like video nowadays but let's look at laser disc now that is sharper 
Not massively so though. Let's zoom in so we can see it a little bit more detail. So look at the sign behind the lady there and then we'll switch back to VHD and you can see the letters on that do get quite a bit softer. In fact, if we zoom in even more, it's pretty hard to read this now, but go back over to Laserdisc again and you can make out a couple of words. You can definitely make out clock on the end of that anyway and perhaps tower at the bottom. But just look at Blu-ray. There you go. That's what Blu-ray looks like. And of course, we zoomed in. If we zoom out, just look at the difference in the colours and the sharpness and things. We really are spoilt now with the modern formats for movies compared to the 80s. However, one thing I should point out, on VHD, this film was shot as an open mat. And what that means is it's cropped for a cinema release and on the Blu-ray, but that's what it should look like. So look at the top right there, Cupid's Adult Store, you can see there, and Mole written at the bottom right. If we go over to the Blu-ray, both of those things are cut off because, of course, that's using the proper aspect ratio which the film is supposed to be shown in. So you, you do get a bit more height with VHD and uh, Laserdisc for that match on these old ones, but I'd much rather watch it on Blu-ray. Another disadvantage with these old formats is the limited capacity. You get to the end of your 60 minutes or whatever it is that fits on one side of a disc and this happens. Side one, end. And at that point you have to get up out of your chair, find the caddy that you put down on the floor, put it back in the machine, get the disc back inside the caddy and then take the caddy out, flip it over and pop side B in the machine. And then once that's in there, you can then carry on with the rest of the film. I suppose it's a good time to take a break or something. But then it starts like this. So you do get a break in the film and it fades in. Now, I should point out that the system worked flawlessly for me. Unlike the CED system, I had no dropouts or glitches whatsoever. Every video played beginning to end completely without any problems. It's basically like a VHS resolution, but without the chroma crosstalk and the other glitches you get with VHS. And the sound's fine as well. It's Dolby surround. It's not Dolby digital, but it's nice and clear and there's no hiss. For me though, the best part comes when the film has finished and it's time to get it out of the machine because I've never used a more satisfying eject mechanism than this one. When it comes to playing back old music formats, I can get just as much fun playing a reel-to-reel -reel recording or a vinyl record as I would a modern day FLAC file. However, when it comes to video, it's quite a different story. It really would take quite a lot to make me want to watch Back to the Future on VHD when I've got the Blu-ray sitting on the shelf that I can watch in high definition instead. Now, of course, there are the occasional films that are available in these older formats that aren't released on the current ones, but they are very few and far between. And especially if you're watching it on VHD, you're going to be watching it with Japanese subtitles at the bottom in standard definition in a cropped pan and scan version. So really, these old video formats are fun to play around with, fun to look at, but when it comes to actually watching films on them, then really they don't quite stand up anymore. However, I hope you've had quite a little bit of fun watching my video about the VHD format, and that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Oh no! The internet's down again! Well, you need to give it a break anyway. You're starting to treat real life just like those message boards that you spend all your time in. No I don't. That's a rubbish assessment. Completely wrong. Thumbs down. Unsubscribed. Perhaps you could do what I'm doing. And read a book. Read a book? Is that how you pronounce it? Book. Lol. Hashtag weirdo. That's how everyone spoke where I was brought up. You cook in an oven, and you hang a coat on a hook. Say, look, I'm your father. Luke, I am your father. No! Oh, if you're just going to be silly, I'm going to ignore you. OK, I've got a real question. What's for tea? Fish and chips. Oh, fish and chips. That's weird, having Doritos with fish. Oh, please don't start pretending you're American. I can't go through this again. 
Wow, you Brits are so weird. If you call french fries chips, what do you call things like Cheetos? I refuse to fall for your trolley. And why are your plug sockets so big? And why do you drive on the wrong side of the road? I suggest you look these things up on Wikipedia when the internet comes back on again. OK, what's for tea? Fish and chips. I just told you in my earlier response. Oh, and I noticed there's something you forgot to mention earlier on. Yes. What's for tea? This question's been asked a number of times already. Please look back at the earlier responses. With regard to tea, could you tell me what we're going to be eating? Right, that's it. I'm putting you on mute. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Hey up! Here, love. Take that head off for a minute. Finally, someone new to speak to. Yes, how can I help? I've just checked and I can't see that anyone's asked this earlier on. What's for tea? Ah! Well, there's no need to be like that. Disappointed. One star.